Lecture 8 for Western Civ 2 on Industrial Revolution. As we begin today, I'd like to take your, your minds devotionally to the, thinking about work. Uh, people are created in this world uh, to work. Uh, there's work for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And uh, while we may look at a respite from our labors, uh, it seems that there's also work for us to do uh, hereafter. But in the in-between time, uh, there's certainly work for us to do. What we find is that this is uh, something that's affirmed in Paul's writings in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, where he tells us there that we're saved by grace through faith for good works. This is the reason why we're saved, is to do good works. And this affirms something that Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, where he said that uh, you know we should labor such that people see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. And so certainly good deeds are part of what we uh, aspire to accomplish as Christians, something we want to spur one another on to, as it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 there, that we spur one another on to greater love and uh, good deeds. Uh, so work is something that uh, Christians are concerned about. It's not that the means by which we're going to be saved. We're going to be saved by the work that Jesus accomplished. But productivity is important in the kingdom of God. And a number of Jesus' parables had affirmed that. So productivity is not just important here in the physical world, uh, in the society in which we live, if we're going to be productive members of society, uh, but it's also important in the kingdom of God. So as we look at those parables of Jesus, uh, the parables of the servants with the talents, or the parables of the minas, uh, clearly the teaching is that Christians' efforts for the kingdom, even here in this world, uh, are significant and will be scrutinized on the day of judgment. Certainly, we want to be counted as good, faithful servants who've responded to God's grace uh, with affection shown in our works as we serve God and serve our fellow man. Today, as we think about uh, working, being industrious, uh, what we're going to see is that there's a, a, a revolution in how people work, uh, the places that people work, uh, the equipment that they employ, that transforms Western civilization. As people are living here in this fallen work world, it's by the sweat of their brow that they labor. There's lots of frustrations that happen with labor uh, in this world. It can be fun to plant a garden, but when you're fighting the weeds, oh, it takes a lot of the fun out of it. It takes, uh, robs us of the joy that we can have in our work. And uh, we want to keep our focus on the big picture in order that we keep working even when the going gets tough as Christian people. But uh, as we work and as we live in this society, certainly our society has been dramatically changed by the work that people engage in. And we want to consider today how changes in production have changed Western society and also to see how those changes have engendered something of a confidence in human, humanity's ability to uh, sustain itself. Uh, unfortunately, some of that confidence results in people's thoughts that uh, they don't need God. So as we think about industrialization, as we begin here, if one's industrious, one is engaged in work and produces things. So there's there's been a lot of sweat and a lot of labor and industry uh, uh, prior to this time. We might look back to very primitive circumstances at the uh, equipment that people might have employed, and we might say that uh, you know that's evidence of certain kinds of industry, uh, certain types of work even if it might be uh, demonstrated in the use of uh, stone tools. Uh, but uh, as we come into the period here of the 19th century, not the 19th century, uh, the 18th century, and moving into the 19th century, what we're going to see is that industrialization is going to take a much, much more uh, prominent role. Uh, people aren't just engaged in sort of primary industry where they're extracting uh, resources from the ground or from plants. Uh, what they've moved on to is manufacturing, and they're doing it on a larger and larger scale. When we do things on a large scale, sometimes we say that uh, we've industrialized something. Um, production prior to the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century was one that was significantly limited. Uh, people worked where there were raw materials or they had to transport those raw materials to places, so you had to have avenues of transport, either by water if something was terribly heavy, uh, or 
over roads if you had equipment that was strong enough to haul your raw materials to the place of production. But uh, many times uh, people have been working using locally available material and uh, they work in locations that are close to those resources. So if you're going to uh, work on uh, smelting metals, you have to work close to mines and where mines are likely going to develop most uh, frequently are going to be where you have a happy coincidence of uh, uh, fuel to smelt metals to heat it up uh, and the iron ore or the other ore that you're looking to employ. Certain metallurgical industry is going to be very significant in the development of Western society. Uh, people have known how to use iron for a long time, but to be able to do it on a large scale uh, requires a lot of organization and some technological discoveries along the way. So prior to Industrial Revolution, industry is limited by uh, people's energy, uh, available materials, uh, their location. Uh, I can't engage in metallurgical industry if, if I don't have fuel available to me. Um, so people worked on a small scale. You had craftsmen who works on, worked on things, and there were specialists who could carry out their uh, process all the way from beginning products all the way to a finished product. Uh, this would be the characteristic of the craft guilds from the Middle Ages. So you had people who were specialists who could carry out these project projects of uh, manufacturing, of making uh, finished products. As we come towards the 18th century, though, what we find is there's a number of factors that promote the Industrial Revolution in Europe and uh, here in the United States as well. One of the things that had promoted the Industrial Revolution was the fact that there were adequate food resources. Uh, these food resources have been brought about because of that uh, geographical revolution of uh, discovering the new world and the new crops that came to the old world, like potatoes, uh, like corn, uh, where there could be lots and lots of calories gr grown uh, on a small amount of land. So fewer people have to be working on the land to provide for a growing population. So this, the first factor here is that there's increased food resources, and so more people can be living off the land. They don't have to be all working on the land because there's enough production that uh, they can support craft specialists. Cities are growing. Population is growing. And with that growing population, there's also an increased demand for manufactured products. There's a market that's growing with the population growth. We also saw was that there's something of a commercial revolution that's been happening where uh, people are looking at profits as being something good. Uh, it's the fruits of one's labor that one can gain benefit. And uh, as they are uh, building up economic systems and banks and uh, ways of moving wealth around, uh, this has allowed for there to be commercial revolution where an individual may not be able to invest in a very expensive machine, but they can in invest uh, through stocks in a collaborative effort uh, to support a company, and then they get a portion of the profits depending upon how much stock that they had in the company. So. These things are all promoting the Industrial Revolution, and we're going to see it's going to be something that particularly flowers early on in England. England also has the benefit of uh, protecting intellectual property. Uh, this was something that had been protected at earlier times uh, in the 16th century in Italy, but uh, that in England, based upon John Locke's ideas, again, where people have certain freedoms and they can use their minds. Uh, something that comes to be uh, established in England is a system of patents where people protect intellectual property rights. So if you discover something, uh, you basically get to have something of a monopoly of the use of that idea uh, for a period of time. This is going to make it uh, advantageous for people to ex discover new things because they can reap the benefits of having made a discovery or made a technological innovation uh, by protecting their uh, discovery with a patent. So the Industrial Revolution is seen to uh, emerge early on in England. We're going to focus here on the textile industry in, 
in England, but uh, it's based upon also a metallurgical industry uh, where they're going to have new equipment they can use to make tools for this uh, textile industry that's going to blossom in England and bring great wealth to them. So as we look at England, England has some geographical advantages. This is why we have the Industrial Revolution emerging in England. First of all, we have geographical opportunities. It's a maritime country. You can never be any more than about 120 miles from the sea anywhere that you are in England. There are a number of rivers that drain the inland portions and provide access points to the sea. So you can come up the Thames River a long way to London or even further uh, and you can have access to the sea. So the water will allow you to float very heavy, large uh, commodities uh, to markets and uh, to ship things. The ocean that surrounds England will also provide an avenue of commerce to export those things to other places where uh, they, there might be markets for your manufactured goods in these areas of colonies that they're establishing. Uh, with their business partners that are established through uh, the various companies that they have that are trading overseas. So their maritime situation is going to be very much to England's benefit. Secondly, you have a happy coincidence of uh, having coal resources and iron resources close together in the central part of England. And this means that you're going to be able to have uh, that heavy fuel in the coal that's used to smelt iron uh, or that uh, is also very heavy and they're in close proximity to each other and uh, as a result you can uh, transform that ore into uh, materials that then can be machined they can be worked over uh, to make equipment uh, to make tools that are highly desired not just in England but around the world as we mentioned generally uh, in England the population had been growing because there's increased food supplies. The Industrial Revolution in England is also advanced by the social structures and political structures of the land. Uh, in England, uh, work was seen as something that was good and proper for people to engage in. It wasn't something that was beneath people. Some people had ideas about uh, the type of work that they may well engage in, but uh, in England, the political structure was one that was fairly unified within Britain, uh, as Scotland and England have been unified. They're not all the uh, little local uh, political boundaries where taxes are collected every time you cross this river into that county. Uh, it's under one system of law. This is going to be beneficial. Uh, there's not all this co complicated uh, taxing infrastructure that existed in England. Beyond that, while they'd had some political turmoil with uh, conflicts, it was a fairly stable place. Uh, people would invest anticipating that they could profit from their labors. They weren't afraid of invasions. And under their laws, there was the protection of property rights. Uh, if a person had property, that would be protected. Uh, John Locke's ideas certainly affirmed this idea and uh, uh, kings just couldn't come along and seize your property wealthy people couldn't come along and seize your property people who had property rights were protected under courts of law economically in England there was venture capital there was money that could be invested joint stock companies had arisen and it was seen to be a uh, honorable thing to make money by investing money. Uh, as you took a risk with your investment, uh, you would claim part of the rewards. In England, they had certainly been building colonial resources as they had build, built markets, uh, as they had built access to places where they could come and trade British manufactured goods for raw materials that might be beneficial. Uh, back in England. And so there's markets for manufactured goods, whether it's uh, metal goods or later on we're going to find that textiles will be a very uh, lucrative item where they're going to sell a spear product at a uh, attractive price uh, which will allow them to crush competition in many places. So 
As we look at the emergence of the Industrial Revolution in England, they had advantages of geography and population, uh, political and economic situation. So let's look at that uh, British textile industry. In England, they've long had uh, flax, which can grow in the moist climate there. And so from that uh, fiber in the, those plants, uh, they could uh, make flax as a uh, long fiber that they can uh, comb and uh, make into threads. But then there's also wool. Since the Middle Ages, the monks that had lived in uh, difficult parts of England were able to raise sheep and uh, had developed a, uh, a textile industry where they were making woolen uh, clothes. Uh, this was a, this this natural fiber is nice in England. It's uh, not always so terribly comfortable, maybe a bit scratchy, but it's warm when it gets wet and uh, breathes a bit when it gets uh, cool. <laughs> Or when it gets hot. I guess I'm a bit confused there. Anyway, in England, uh, they've been using old technology that had been developed at earlier times, uh, where they used uh, by hand, they would spin uh, fibers into threads, which could then be woven into uh, cloth. Uh, this is very old technology. They did this back in the time of Abraham. Those tents that he had were uh, things that were woven. So we go all the way back to the Bronze Age. Uh, people have been weaving from early on, and we have examples of that from archaeological context. So uh, people were using woven cloths for a very, very long time. In England, though, they're going to be uh, making some developments. Again, they've been able to make cloth for centuries and centuries, but there's going to be some developments that make for better cloth and uh, will allow them to defeat their rivals when it comes to economic competition. And this is going to be based upon the use of machinery. Now in times past they had had horizontal looms which are basically built upon the ground where a person can sit on the ground and uh, move the uh, the weft threads amongst the warp threads going back and forth up and down, but when you can create a, a gap between the alternating threads, uh, this is known as a shed, an opening, and you can pass the thread through, it certainly accelerates the uh, production of uh, cloth from which then you can make clothes or awnings, things like tents that we mentioned here earlier. In England, uh, they have moved from having a horizontal loom to a vertical loom. People typically uh, weave things using their own private equipment. Uh, they spin thread using their private equipment. Traditionally, the distaff had been a symbol of uh, women's work from time of the Romans, where they would spin uh, fibers like wool into thread that can then be woven on looms into uh, clothes that they would wear. In England at this point in time, most of the work takes place in people's homes. People own this type of equipment. Uh, they can make a, uh, they can spin things just in their hands, but uh, something that had been developed at an earlier time was the spinning wheel. Relatively uh, simple piece of equipment uh, made out of wood, a few metal parts, uh, and this is something that individual could house within their uh, dwellings that they could use in the evenings or in the winter time when the there's not crops to be gotten in otherwise an industrious person could work uh, turning uh, fleeces into uh, yarn that can then be uh, crocheted or knitted into uh, usable clothes or it can be woven into textiles that people can employ for various purposes. So it's very much hands-on, manual labor, rather simple equipment, uh, simple equipment that can be maintained locally by a local woodworker if you yourself can't uh, fix things yourself. Pretty simple equipment. The vertical loom uh, was certainly more complicated and um, but it was something that spread and as you get bigger vertical looms, 
uh, this is oftentimes going to be men's work. The women are going to be involved oftentimes um, spinning yarn. And then the men will take the yarn and weave it into textiles. So this is something that the, a family might do at home of an evening. And if you have a couple people spinning, basically, you know, the person weaving can uh, match their product rate of production. So you could, you could take stuff and work within even one home, or it may just be that somebody entrusts you with uh, a large amount of uh, wool, and then you turn that into um, into yarn because first of all you comb it, you card it, and then you. Uh, uh, pull that out piece by piece, gently spinning it uh, to make yarn. So yarn making is something you could do, or if somebody had uh, big balls of yarn uh, and you were a, a weaver, then you could weave the cloth, weave the yarn into textiles that you could then um, be able to sell to somebody who made clothes, for example. So Technologically, things have continued on. They've they've maintained enough uh, uh, clothes for people. People don't have many changes of clothes. This is going to be something that changes. Is that there's going to be more clothes available as prices go down. Up to this point in time, clothes are a very expensive commodity uh, that you would invest in. So this this vertical loom is one that you can sit at a bench and work and you can move uh, the various parts in front of you and what they had done in times past was to pass a shuttle that carried a bobbin of thread back and forth between the alternating um, warp threads what happens in 1733 is that John K invents a way to speed up the movement of that shuttle back and forth carrying the thread it's basically a pointed piece of wood uh, that has a uh, two pointed ends that allow it to pass through that gap in the threads the so-called sh shred yeah shed and inside of that uh, it carries a bobbin that distributes thread as it moves along so what's happening is that manually they're passing that shuttle carrying that bobbin between the threads and then once it gets the other side they change the alternating threads and they pass it back through the other side and tamp they comb that uh, resulting uh, layer of threads down the uh, fly shuttle speeds things up here as that shuttle now is not just passed uh, manually but it slides. What John Kay does is he creates a race, uh, basically a groove, in which the shuttle slides. So you can throw it back and forth along this race. And the result is you can throw it further than you can pass it. Before, if you had a wide piece of textile, we'll say you're making something that would be 60 inches wide, you'd have to have somebody helping you to pass that back and forth through the alternating threads. With the fly shuttle, you can throw it, and it will uh, move between the two uh, readily. Sometimes they even will put uh, materials that will reduce friction, and sometimes even little rollers on this, so it'll move very quickly along that race. John Kay's flying shuttle uh, is going to result in dramatically increased production rates on looms before it taken a couple of weaver a couple of spinners to keep up with a weaver now particularly as they develop a spring-loaded type of uh, fly shuttle and it flies from one box on one side to a box on the other uh, what they can do is that they can uh, they basically going to need eight spinners to keep up with one weaver uh, they can they can use up thread faster than people can spin it, uh, spin the yarn, uh, spin spin the fibers into yarn. So uh, there's a, a, a huge demand for thread. In response to that, a few years later, we're going to find that uh, James Hargraves is going to come up with a uh, device that. Uh, 
addresses the need for more yarn, more thread. Uh, the story is told that uh, what he observed is that while his uh, when his wife's spinning wheel got knocked over that the wheel kept going around and what this helped him to understand is that uh, he could change the orientation machine to some degree and uh, the result was he created something that he named the spinning jenny supposedly this is named after his wife or his daughter but the spinning jenny is going to make multiple uh, threads all at the same time. So you can make up to eight uh, balls of thread all at the same time. Uh, this helps the uh, the industry, but uh, it's going to cause a great deal of concern. Now these, these machines we're going to find cause concern because products can be made much more quickly. And uh, the result is that some people may be put out of work. We'll see something of the reaction here a little bit later. As we move on, uh, about the same time as James Hargreaves is developing his uh, uh, spinning jenny, uh, an uh, inventor by the name of Richard Arkwright will develop the water frame in 1769. Uh, it's basically going to be another device for uh, making uh, threads that this time will be powered by a water wheel. So that's where the water frame comes into the name here. It's driven by rotational power that comes off of a water wheel. Uh, this is one of the advantages of, of uh, this type of production is, you know, the river doesn't get tired of running. Uh, other human and animal sourced uh, bases of power will uh, weary along the way, but the, the river doesn't get tired of running. It may run out of water, but uh, otherwise it's going to keep running. Edward um, Cartwright in 1785 will develop the power loom. This is where that uh, mill power will be used then to uh, be applied to the weaving side of the operation. There'll be many other technological developments as they learn to use different kinds of uh, treatments on thread. John Mercer's famous for mercerization. Uh, it'll be about a Another 75 years later, here as we come to uh, the, the middle of the 1800s, that Mercer comes up with his system of treating uh, cotton fibers, um, because by treating them in, with certain chemistry, uh, they develop a shinier luster, and uh, they also develop certain strength. Uh, and this will be a concern that they have, which will be the strength of the fibers that they're using to weave with. The British textile industry is going to be uh, amazing in that they're going to move from uh, supplying domestic needs to exporting cloth. They're going to have to import raw materials. Cotton doesn't grow well in England, and so they're going to be importing cloth, uh, the, the fibers that they need. Uh, this will have a dramatic effect on the American South for years to come, as they're going to grow cotton in the American South. and. Uh, in uh, India, which had long a uh, self a lo a local uh, textile industry, uh, that industry will basically be killed off because the the British will undercut them financially. With their development of equipment, they can outproduce the Indian local inhabitants. This will be something that we we move all the way up to about 19. 30s and 40s that uh, we'll find that Gandhi will be fighting to recreate a local homespun industry where they go back to the old technologies in India and uh, use Indian cotton uh, rather than importing uh, cloth that comes from England. It'll be one of the ways that he fights to uh, bring about changes there. But the English are going to uh, hold their new technologies very carefully. Individual inventors will hold on to this and uh, many of them will benefit as they're able to sell their their patented uh, devices, their pieces of equipment uh, that they develop and uh, protect their interests that way. So they get a percentage or they work out some sort of a, other arrangement where they're the only ones who can make a certain type of piece of equipment and they profit from it. As they have profits, they have more money to invest in uh, new inventions that might uh, help make them 
for their future profits as they make uh, improvements on these pieces of technology. So production and profits go way up in the English textile industry and they're able to crush their opposition. This will be something that the British Navy, the maritime forces are going to be carrying around the world is they have superior cloth. Uh, cloth that uh, is quite beautiful in that uh, they've learned how to use color fast dyes that uh, they can use to dye cotton cloth that uh, is going to be very durable and superior to that which can be locally manufactured. They don't tell everybody how to do it and how to build their own equipment. This will be a, a bit of a revolution when a uh, person works in a factory in England and basically memorizes how to make certain pieces of equipment and that's how uh, textile manufacturing will come to be developed in the uh, New England states, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the American Revolution where English patents aren't being protected uh, in the same sorts of ways as they had before. The industrial production that we see in England in this textile industry is going to expand into other industries as well uh, and it will expand across Europe. Uh, there are a number of reasons why England's ahead, again, just some advantageous aspects to their situation, but also uh, because in Europe things had been divided politically and they'd had that uh, sequences of wars with the French Revolution and subsequently the uh, European Wars of Napoleon. So their progress is going to be delayed until after 1815. After 1815, uh, the political boundaries will be reduced in places like France there will be one set of law across the country and uh, this is going to help to uh, expedite the movement of goods and materials. Uh, there's going to be investment in infrastructure for moving things along canals and the like but uh, England gets a head start on Europe. England has a more positive view towards work and towards profit uh, than particularly the southern part of Europe had. Uh, they look at, looked at profits as being uh, uh, something more negative and they didn't have the same sort of uh, entrepreneurial monies as the northern uh, parts of Europe had and they weren't as supportive of banks and the like. In uh, the Industrial Revolution, besides this uh, uh, textile manufacturing, metallurgical uh, technology is very very important to learn how to uh, make metal equipment again the, the textile industry is going to depend upon metal equipment so if you didn't have metallurgical technology developing uh, they would be certainly limited in the uh, different shapes of, that they can make uh, durable tools and uh, learning how to make things exactly the same is an important step that's made uh, first of all you've got to get the metal itself and so developing furnaces that can produce much larger quantities of iron are important. Uh, so they're going to develop uh, larger furnaces, hotter furnaces, uh, ways of stamping out these uh, uh, red-hot pieces of metal so that they can be purified. Uh, this is going to be done using uh, things like water wheels initially uh, where you can make trip hammers that don't get tired like a blacksmith's arm, you know, swinging a big heavy hammer. Uh, you can turn hammers that are much bigger than any person could ever lift and uh, smite a much heavier blow as a result. So metallurgical technology is developing and uh, the iron industry is going to be advantaged, particularly as they develop new fuels, uh, turning coal into something called coke and uh, uh, developing new processes that allow them to have uh, more metal and that metal then can be uh, shaped into um, useful shapes that can make axles and uh, handles for uh, turning spinning wheels for example but much of that had been hand worked before what we're going to find is there's an increasing move towards making metal machines uh, machines that can make duplicate copies that are the exact same. Now some that they've long known have been lathes. This is where you spin a piece of wood or stone or other material on a pivot 
and you put a cutting edge up against that and you can have a guide that's there and you can make spindles for example for the back of a chair which are all the same shape something they're going to use from observing cutting wood this way is that they can also work on cutting metal now in order to cut metal they need harder metal chisels uh, they need to work on developing drills uh, that's going to be something that comes in time but as they have harder uh, metal pieces that can drill into other pieces this is going to help them to shape uh, metal and uh, using metal lathes uh, they can make consistent products uh, they can drill holes that are the same size uh, they can make lathes that have certain moving parts where they can start to develop making screws prior to that they've been carving screws uh, when you carve screws it's hard to make them uniformly the same they don't fit so tightly and snugly they don't hold together as well and so what they're doing is they're working to make more and more machinery that's helping make machinery this is going to be a, a very important development in uh, what comes along as the new power of the industrial revolution is going to be the steam power in order to have steam engines uh, you have to have metal that can be shaped going back to Hellenistic era they knew about uh, steam forces as they heat steam up they could create interesting little parlor devices that could go round and round as you put a candle underneath them and the water inside uh, heats up then the the, the uh, steam could pour out of little jets that could make the little ball go round and round so it's an interesting parlor piece but um, in the middle of the um, the 18th century the Newcomen engine took the old atmospheric engine which had been known from Hellenistic and Roman times and made it something practical not just a, a parlor event but these were huge great pieces of equipment and the uh, pistons and the cylinders that were made were all hammered out uh, it took a whole lot of finesse to to hammer these things out to get them in the shape that was desired and uh, the result was that it wasn't very satisfactory there's a lot of uh, leakage of the pressure that's uh, wanted here from the steam uh, through these pistons that are handmade and so what they've got to do is they've got to come up with better uh, machining tools and this is something that's developing here as they uh, develop the use of lathes and drills uh, making molds into which they can pour uh, metal they can cast metal into shapes that they desire and uh, machine tools are an important move in this regard where they can develop uh, lathes that can bore down they can drill down into metal and make perfect cylinders and they can uh, turn other pieces of metal and again make perfect cylinders so the uh, steam cylinder can fit inside of the sleeve in which it's going to move up and down so you can come to have greater and greater precision and you're not going to lose the uh, the pressure um, as a result of a large or irregular uh, side uh, gap between these two moving parts these two parts uh, that there's movement in anyway so James Watt is going to be identified as the inventor uh, and the, 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 the one who pushes uh, steam power but the Newcomen engine had existed uh, for a, a generation prior to James Watt James Watt is going to work together with another fellow by the name Bolton to develop uh, these engines the critical item that he develops is a condenser what had been happening before was that uh, in the Newcomen engines they're great big engines which were very very power hungry what happened is they're using an extraordinary amount of fuel and these are huge great pieces of equipment and so the only place where they're used was at mines where they uh, they could operate at the head and they could pull a bucket uh, chain up out of a deep mine you know, making it possible for them to dig for coal and for iron down below uh, where otherwise they might be flooded by the intrusion of water so they can basically keep ahead of the flood waters by having this piece of equipment that just goes all the time uh, the advantage of steam power here over animal power is that you know the animals get tired uh, this equipment 
didn't have to rest overnight. Oh, you might have to have somebody who fed the, the monster, uh, and it was very expensive, but the result was that tomorrow the workers could go down and uh, uh, they could keep mining. They might even mine through the night if they're needing light down there anyway. It didn't matter whether they worked day or night. And th the steam power could keep this going, whereas animals get tired and have to be spelled out, uh, and they take more maintenance uh, than some of these engines if they're working well. So the Newcomen engine was something that was applied, particularly in the area of mines, but didn't have too much other practical application because it's just a big, expensive piece of equipment. Only a, a big mining operation could justify such a horrible expense. So one of the problems was that it's just such a power-hungry thing. It need, needs so much fuel. And so how do you reduce the fuel? What he does is he basically makes it so you don't have to... Every time the cylinder goes up and down, it's heating and cooling. What he does instead is he creates a condenser and he can he conserves a lot of the heat that's being used in the steam engine and so it doesn't take as much power this is going to make it economically much more viable using machine tooled parts he's going to make it a tighter fit and therefore it's once again going to be a more efficient engine that he's going to create so james watt creates this 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 engine and he also learns how to direct the power so it becomes rotational power instead of just going back and forth uh, by connecting that with uh, certain gears as those pistons go back and forth he can turn it into rotational power which then can be applied in places like where you, you might have a water wheel the beauty of steam power is that what you need is you need one of these expensive pieces of equipment you need water and you need fuel but it's it's not as it's, it doesn't have the limitations that certain other power sources had up to this point in time. Up to this point in time, coming out of the Roman and medieval times, you had water wheels, and the overshot wheel was certainly more powerful than the undershot wheel. But what happens when the water table drops when there's a drought? Well, you can't use it. Um, they had also developed uh, the sails on windmills, and uh, from the, the Middle Ages. This had been a way that they'd ground corn in various places where it was windy, but there's days when the wind doesn't blow. And on those days, you can't turn your corn into flour, your, your wheat into flour. So the uh, beauty of steam power is that, that it's not going to be dependent upon uh, the weather in the same way. It's going to be dependent upon you having fuel to, to fuel this thing, but when the fuel demands are not quite so high, then this becomes much more profitable. When they learn to uh, drive rotational shafts, then there's going to be more applications for this. Uh, so you can grind your grain using this, or you can uh, power these new pieces of equipment that are being uh, developed. There will be a number of other revolutions that take place as these things go round and round. Uh, James Watt uh, has to fight to protect his patent. Uh, but he's going to become quite wealthy in this. He's going to develop a number of other inventions. He's going to have other patents which improve upon his engine as times go, time goes on. As people apply this new source of power, it's still a very large piece of equipment, one on which you're going to burn yourself if you don't look out, one which can crush you as it goes round and round, one in which there's some danger. If you get too much pressure, uh, you can have an explosion, and this uh, piece of metal fracture under great pressure. Uh, you basically have shrapnel. It's like a grenade going off where you have a piece of metal flying through the air which can uh, chop people to bits. So there's some concern about these pieces of equipment uh, that uh, exist in this time period. But when you apply these things in the right places, there can be uh, serious advantages that are drawn from this. So, the first great place where this is applied, uh, besides these mines and, and growing factories, is you're going to be using uh, rotational power off of steam engines to drive things like uh, power looms. No longer do you have to be by the river. Uh, you can be places where you happen to have fuel and uh, you, you can uh, drive equipment and uh, it doesn't matter upon what season and whether the river's flowing and this sort of thing. 
Besides powering new industrial plants, uh, factories, this is something that uh, Richard Arkwright is particularly going to be behind as he uh, changes the way that people work in his factories where they're spinning thread. No longer do you have to have specialists. Uh, people just do small parts of the process along the way and they basically man these machines. The machines doing this work and you know what you're doing is you're threading needles, you're uh, tying knots in thread uh, and the like uh, and the machines are doing this work which before had taken people who perhaps had taken all their life to develop their skills and techniques and now you don't need quite such the same level of experience and skill. Uh, there's danger working around these machines. We'll find that's going to create some reaction. I mean, the machine doesn't know to stop when you get in the way and it'll crush you. Um, but in applying steam power, besides in these new factories, there's going to be steam power applied towards transportation. Now they've been developing some new means of transportation to haul heavy goods. If you want to move uh, coal from a factory uh, to a, uh, a location where it can be used. Uh, you can haul it in wheeled wagons. The problem is when it rains the roads get terribly bogged down so you can uh, put gravel in the roads and pack them and they can be harder. But uh, there's still a lot of friction that's there and so you might grade the roads and make the, the rough places smooth. You might build bridges so that you don't have to go down to go up again. And uh, what they develop is wooden tramways where they basically put wheels that ran on wooden rails and they could transport heavy things like iron ore or coal from mines to where the materials were going to be processed. There's a whole lot less friction when you're traveling on a wooden rail. But you still have to have horses to pull it, but when, when there's less friction the horse can pull bigger wagons carrying heavy lo heavier loads than they might otherwise be able to carry. When the roads are prepared this way, there's not as much up and down hill, uh, again, less friction, the animal can uh, do a better job. And so this is already accelerating movement of people, and that's going to change life in cities as people learn to move more quickly. But it's going to be a very important development as the steam engine is going to be applied towards transportation. The first place that it gets applied towards transportation are on large boats. Robert Fulton does this in 1807. This is going to transform uh, the world in many ways. Connected here with this industrial revolution, and particularly the revolutionary power of steam which drives these factories, is going to be a transportation revolution. Uh, Robert Fulton, by applying steam towards boats, uh, you can put that great big engine in a, in a large boat. You can put a whole huge pile of coal to feed into the, uh, the uh, firebox uh, on top of that boat and uh, you can transport large amounts of goods against the current. Uh, here in the Americas it was easy to travel downstream to put some raft on the Ohio River. Uh, there are a few places where there are rapids but uh, you could uh, basically pull your very heavy products from the hinterlands down uh, the Ohio River to the Mississippi all the way down to Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico where it can be uh, shipped onto large ocean going ships and go around the world. But how do you get back up the Mississippi? Well, the Mississippi had uh, wasn't one that flowed terribly quickly and so you could pull your way back up, but when you come hundreds of miles floating with the current, it's very difficult to go hundred miles, hundreds of miles against the current. You have to stay in the shallows where your pole can reach the bottom and, and fight the current all the way back upstream. So typically what they did is they made rafts that made a one-way trip. The rafts were made of wood which could then subsequently be uh, manufactured into something else uh, down the south. But with uh, the steamboat, you can move against the current of the Mississippi and go upstream and you can haul barges that can carry great amounts of goods. When they first start these engines you have paddle wheelers. Um, typically you're going to have stern wheelers and side wheelers. Uh, we're going to have to wait all the way up until uh, the 1850s to really have the embrace of propellers. 
Again, that rotational power can be directed towards the propeller. Uh, that's going to be simpler than having these uh, side wheels or paddle wheels at the, the stern of a boat. But it's going to open up the American waterways and it's going to transform uh, transportation. As people can now move, not having to worry about the wind and the waves so much, uh, worrying about being able to plot ocean currents and know in which latitudes they would find winds blowing in certain directions at certain times of the year and ocean currents plotted on maps. Now people can go more directly when they want to go rather than waiting for the correct season of the year uh, to engage in long distance transportation. So this application of steam power is going to revolutionize transportation on the water. And it will also later revolutionize warfare on the water. Uh, whereas before, warships came alongside each other and are going to shoot broadsides at each other from their cannons. Once we have steam power, you can fight head on and uh, chase down your, your, uh, your opposition. And so it's, it's going to have all kinds of ramifications here as it moves not just uh, resources and people, but also soldiers, and it enables people to project their power. When people don't have this kind of equipment, uh, they can get chased down rather quickly. Uh, if all they have is sails and they hit the doldrums uh, crossing the equator, uh, a steam-powered ship can chase them down if it has enough fuel. There's not a problem in catching a wind-powered ship at that point. Another application is going to be on land, where you take these big heavy pieces of equipment and you apply them to what come to be locomotives. The first successful locomotive is one by an English inventor by the name of George Stevenson, who in 1829 develops the rocket. It's not that it's that terribly fast. In the initial trials, uh, the rocket will lose a race to a horse-drawn piece of equipment. But pretty soon, it's regularly running steadily at 16 miles an hour. And it can do that for longer than a horse can maintain that speed. And it's going to prove that it can carry much larger quantities than a horse-drawn uh, tramway can pull. So it's not going to take long for this to revolutionize transportation over land, particularly for heavy goods. Prior to this, they've been building canals where they can float things, investing great amounts of money, uh, creating locks where they can control water flows, and uh, transport goods by land. This is why here in Elizabeth City in 1805 we have the completion of the Great Dismal Swamp Canal. Uh, but yet in the years that follow, most often what happens is that a, on the towpath along a canal, what we find is it's replaced by a railroad track that uh, uses that flat land where the tow animals used to pull things along that artificial river, now becomes an area where a steam train will run. Uh, and so these canals will quickly be uh, replaced. You don't have to worry about uh, maintaining water flows and all those dams and those sorts of things uh, as you can build these iron rails that are strong enough to carry very heavy uh, mobile steam engines, uh, which when applying their power can pull fantastically heavy loads uh, down these rails. It's an incredible investment. It's very, very expensive to do. But there are profits to be made by those who have money to invest in these things. Within a lifetime, people are going to move from moving along at a fairly pedestrian rate to moving at over 50 miles an hour. This is an amazing transportation revolution. When you can go from a very fast round trip going around the Atlantic, because you know the wind and the waves, uh, where it takes you uh, the best part of three months to make a round trip voyage from Liverpool to New York to where you can do that uh, in a period of uh, one month. And that costs you a lot of coal in doing that, but the process is you can travel much, much more quickly. Uh, the, fir the first uh, records are set, it takes 14 days to cross instead of sometimes six weeks and more. So this, this is a, 
uh, something that makes the world, in a sense, smaller. The world's the same size, but the speed at which people are moving and which goods and services can move are being transformed. The speed at which products can move from one part of the world to another are being transformed. And this helps fuel this industrial revolution. Uh, there's profits to be made, and people are uh, looking to be more and more productive, and as they can get their products to markets that are far away in timely matter, uh, that makes their uh, production investments more and more profitable. So the Industrial Revolution, powered by steam, will change the place of work, and it's going to change uh, the, uh, the way that people get around. There's a lot of changes that steam power is going to bring about uh, for people. But there's some consequences that uh, people face that they weren't all happy about. First of all, there's a number of social uh, consequences of this industrial revolution. As there comes to be jobs where there are these factories, there's a move towards moving away from the, the countryside into urban settings. And urban life was different from living in rural life. In the first generations of the Industrial Revolution, people would come to the cities and work, uh, make money, and then sometimes return with their money uh, to the countryside. They made a nest egg, which now allowed them to live better off than the neighbors, and uh, they were satisfied with what they had. But people will increasingly be moving to these factories, and as these factories and uh, industrial production facilities grow, they're going to move away from craft specialists to people who are increasingly just smaller cogs in the wheel. They're not like those old guild members of old who knew the whole product, who knew how to take things from the raw materials to the finished product. Instead, they're oftentimes individuals who might have known some of those things, but now they just do one little step in a much larger process. They're not as essential. And so what happens is that pay is going to decrease as people flock towards the city and want these jobs. Uh, the people who have the jobs can pay uh, less for the jobs. In those cities, uh, people live much closer together than they had in the countryside. Now, traditionally coming out of the Middle Ages, uh, people live very close to each other in the countryside, uh, but uh, the neighbors weren't quite so close as they are in urban settings where people live in tenement houses as buildings are getting taller and taller and people are living packed together and uh, increasing squalor. Uh, what, what do you do with all the sewage? Uh, the cities get to be increasingly polluted places. Uh, urban life was something that could be dangerous because of disease with all the manure that's around or the polluted water that you're uh, having to drink. So everything wasn't good uh, coming here. Is, it changes the way that people live. But as people live, we'll find that also wealthy people are going to tend to move away from those places, particularly as there's increasing transportation opportunities. They'll move away from where they work, whereas the workers are moving to where they work. Uh, the entrepreneurs are often going to work, move a little further away from their work, where the atmosphere is a little cleaner. It's not as smoky. It's not as stinky. And uh, they'll commute into their work, and they'll live in uh, what grow to be suburbs rather than being in urban centers where it's quite so densely packed. They'll have bigger houses, more space, and there's going to be a growing difference in life between uh, the entrepreneurs who own these factories and manage these factories and the people who are actually working them. There hadn't been quite the same uh, distance in the material possessions and lifestyle at an earlier time. For people moving from the countryside, there was a change in the rhythm of life. When they'd worked on the manor, uh, people had worked at farming, and there were seasonal fluctuations. There were times when you worked incredibly hard and the days were long, but then there might come to be winter when the work changed. You weren't out in the cold, instead you stayed inside, and uh, perhaps you turned wool into thread, or you processed uh, peas or uh, whatever your product might have been. And so there was a, an ebb and flow to life where you had times when you weren't quite so busy and you got to rest. Other times you're, you're very, very busy. It changed with the season and the tasks of, of the season. You were your own boss. 
if you were working as you took in materials to process within your home and you were going to spin uh, wool into thread or linen into thread well you combed it at your rate using your equipment and you produced materials because you got paid by the product that you produce so if you worked very hard you could get a whole lot done and take on extra work perhaps and make more profits off of what you produced but you used your equipment your combs your spinning wheel your loom but as people move to these urban centers and they work in factories they're no longer able to regulate their life when you get tired you take a break you know, before, if you'd plowed uh, down across a field, you come to the end of the field, uh, you take a water break. You let the, the oxen that pulled, they needed a break, and you need a break, and uh, you get to talk to somebody else. Once they've rested enough, then you plow back the other end of the field. Turn the plow around, and you get a break again. In these new factories, you don't get a break. You're expected to work at the rate of this equipment that's working. And so the rhythm of life changes. People's control over their life is lost. Some people are increasingly alienated by this. Some people are going to grow to be hostile towards this new equipment and this increased productivity, which is driving down prices on the things that they used to make by hand. They also see the social stratification uh, in the way that they live and the way that the owners live. There's a number of interesting individual responses. Workers who come and work can always quit if they don't like conditions. Uh, if they're not economically committed otherwise, they can come work, make profits, and leave and go back to the countryside like they had in the beginning. But as economics change and as prices change, and sometimes people make commitments, they're not just free to quit whenever they want to. And when there's not just this huge press for labor, then it may be more difficult to get a job next time around. Maybe I need to hold on to this job. And so people are reticent to uh, quit their jobs. And uh, uh, so this is going to be something that uh, they could have done earlier on that gets harder to do. They can always quit, but sometimes they may get blackballed as a result where they won't get hired back. Uh, when they want to come back and they, they're, they're ready to work again, when they've had some uh, rest and relaxation. Another individual response that people have to this new pressure where things are outside their control is that uh, uh, they can basically keep pressing as long and hard as they can uh, and uh, try to forget their troubles. What we're going to find in England is that the uh, gin consumption rate is going to grow astronomically as people engage in some self-medication. Uh, as they come off their shifts, they'll go to gin joints to try and feel better about themselves. And what we're going to find is that alcoholism is going to be uh, one of the people, what responses that people have to uh, the increasingly mind-numbing circumstances of their work, uh, where it doesn't take any great specialized skill you do your little part in the process and stay out of the machine's way so that it doesn't grab you and chew you up. Uh, some individuals can protest against these things, but they're going to be uh, fired if uh, they don't like their circumstances. So there's a number of individual responses that people can engage in, but what we're also going to see is that here in this industrializing society is there's also going to be collective responses. Uh, where workers are going to sometimes band together. As industrialization is just getting underway with the development of the fly shuttle, there are many people who hated the fly shuttle. Uh, John Kay suffered uh, attacks on a number of occasions where his equipment was destroyed. Uh, with his fly shuttle, uh, the looms that he had could outproduce anybody else. And what's happening is it's driving down the price of woven goods. That means that others have to produce more in order to make a living and feed their families. And so sometimes, collectively, people would attack uh, people who had pieces of equipment which were giving them an advantage. 
across Europe, we're going to find this is be something of a resentment when there comes to be new technologies and ways that people have always made their life is suddenly not profitable any longer. Uh, we see this going on in the United States today when there's new technologies that come along. Well, hey, we don't need people like you anymore, and people are uh, released for the, their employment. And uh, certainly there's hard feelings that come from that. A group of people that uh, attack machines are known as the Luddites. Uh, the Luddites are going to embark on uh, attacks on this weaving equipment, and uh, they're, uh, they believe that machines are inherently evil. Uh, certainly it's bringing about dramatic social change and change in the means of production. Another uh, response that sometimes individuals or groups might engage in would be in sabotage. Our work sabotage comes from the Dutch word for sabot, uh, which refers to a wooden shoe. Uh, to engage in sabotage is to throw your wooden shoe into the mechanical works. Here you've got these uh, geared teeth on uh, metal gears. Uh, they're all made to fit very closely together. They're nicely greased up to reduce friction, but uh, when you put something in the middle of those, uh, it breaks things down. Someplace it's going to shear a cotter pin. As a result, oh, we need the engineer to come uh, fix this. And so when the equipment breaks down, then everybody gets a break. Maybe at some time you might have uh, witnessed an old nostalgia TV episode of uh, I Love Lucy when Lucille Ball and her friend are uh, uh, working in a chocolate factory wrapping candies. Now, how do you keep up with the production rate? Uh, you can only eat so many. Uh, well, their strategy here from early on was, well, you just accidentally cause the machinery to break down, and that way, hey, we get to take a respite, and I get to talk to the person who's working next to me uh, until the equipment gets fixed. So we, we create some breakdowns. As we move later on in the Industrial Revolution, what we're going to find is some of these workers are going to band together to create uh, trade unions. Now, previously, uh, different kinds of crafts guilds had protected the, pr the prices and the production rates, which helped protect prices in their particular area of specialization. Uh, what we're going to find is the workers are going to start to band together to try to uh, protect their interests. Uh, because they're vulnerable. You know, they can't just come to work when they want. They come when the factory whistle blows. If they're late, uh, their pay is docked. When there's lots of people wanting a job, they may get fired. Um, you know, how, how late can one be? Can one be sick? Uh, these are going to be issues that uh, they're going to deal have to deal with. You know, what happens if I don't think, do, produce quite fast enough? You know. Uh, there's going to be a lot of issues that emerge here. A lot of people's lives are going to be used up in the process. As we think about consequences, we've talked about all these social consequences, uh, but there'll also be economic consequences where uh, some of them are going to be very positive in that uh, the price of some manufactured goods are going to go down dramatically and the product is going to be uh, far superior. Uh, but there's also negatives where we've seen people are put out of work, uh, where people's independence is uh, lost. They get they move from being uh, self-employed people to people who are uh, dependent upon somebody else's uh, uh, investments before they'd own the instruments of production, the tools. Now they're using somebody else's tools. They don't know the whole process. They just know their little piece. And so this is going to have ramifications in how people think about themselves uh, and uh, certainly have an impact on society. As more and more people come to these urban settings, uh, the, the prices paid uh, to manufacturing workers will be reduced and uh, where they can get by spending less, uh, they'll do that. Before, people had worked as families. They'd worked in the fields together. Uh, now they'll be segregating their work. Men and the family may work in some places, and the women may work in another place, and the children will work in another place. But you know, if my children aren't working with me, then I'm not there to protect them, to say, oh, uh, you're using a sharp piece of equipment, uh, maybe you're not ready to handle that quite yet. And uh, 
so we're going to find there's uh, something of a assault that happens on the working family and uh, we're going to find that there's going to be eventually some response uh, to labor conditions for men uh, for women and for children but that's going to take a while in conjunction with the industrial revolution there came to be a number of philosophical discussions that emerged as people uh, reflected upon the changes that were going on uh, certainly uh, the ideas that had come from uh, earlier times and the enlightenment of philosophers regarding economics particularly people like Adam Smith were influential uh, but others would build upon what Adam Smith had to say and think and particularly in this changing society uh, the first person I draw your attention to would be Thomas Malthus uh, he lived from 1766 until 1834 and uh, he'll give his name to something called Malthusianism he was a clergyman in the Church of England but uh, as he observed the world he wasn't as optimistic as some of these other people that things were all going to get better and better uh, as he looked at the world he saw uh, a history of calamities in a fallen world and uh, saw that as being fairly normal again death comes to be fairly normal from the Malthusian perspective and that growth in population is marked by uh, subsequent catastrophes and so as he studied society in England he wrote his essay on population in 1798 and uh, he's going to be an opponent to some people who want to uh, protect the poor through poor laws um, any hint that wages would be uh, maintained at certain rates this was not something that he was interested in doing um, another political philosopher economic philosopher that he deals with is a fellow by the name of David Ricardo who came from a Jewish background uh, came to be a, a Unitarian but in seven, he lived from 1772 until 1823 and uh, he would be another person discussing uh, the economy and society uh, of the early 19th century uh, he's going to have the idea particularly that uh, uh, you know free trade is something that's good in that regard Malthus and Ricardo are going to agree uh, with Adam Smith they're going to be opposed to any societal changes that the government would bring about whether by interfering in prices or in uh, interfering with laws would deal with uh, employing people basically the world is the way that it is and we need to figure out laws within that something that emerges from their discussion uh, that isn't attributed exactly to them but it's connected with their type of thinking is something called the iron law of wages the basic idea was that real wages um, gravitate uh, to be the wage needed to sustain the life of a worker so you're not going to do any good for anybody by increasing wages. The basic idea here that Malthus and these others are going to espouse is that if you pay better wages, then your workers are going to have more children. When they have more children, they're going to have greater expenses and there's going to be greater competition for jobs. As a result, the price that's paid in observing the law of supply and demand uh, wages will go down and when wages go down well then there's uh, deprivation there's lack of food uh, people starve there's greater uh, mortality rate and uh, when more people die then uh, in response to that there's a greater demand for labor uh, and so there will be a increase in wages and when there's an increase in wages then this vicious cycle goes on and on Thomas Malthus will be a fellow who is going to be very influential in shaping the ideas of uh, Charles Darwin in the middle part of the 19th century. He sees uh, death and disaster as being normal in the world in which we live. And this is going to be something that Darwin's ideas are going to be founded upon. But there are others who, as they think about the circumstances of the day, are, are trying to figure out ways to have something of a better society. Uh, some of these individuals have uh, repudiated the church and its uh, role in society. 
And so there'll be people like Jeremy Bentham or John Stuart Mill uh, or Robert Owen. All these fellows moved to become atheists. Uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, gives his name to followers known as Benthamites. He lives from 1748 up until 1832. But uh, Benthamites espouse, espouse a certain kind of utilitarianism. They're very concerned about what works. And in determining what's right and wrong, uh, that kind of morality is determined by what gives the, the greatest benefit to the greatest number. It's very pragmatic. And so we're going to find that the utilitarians, unlike those that follow Malthus, are going to be people who want to bring about changes in society, uh, to make things better, uh, to have greater freedoms. Uh, Jeremy Bentham is going to be an advocate of all kinds of very modern sounding things. Uh, for his day, he was a champion of abolition, that is getting rid of slavery. Um, but he will also be very much uh, a supporter of uh, uh, freedom and sexuality and uh, throwing off some of the constraints the church had uh, culturally dominated. Uh, there's a number of areas where his uh, liberalism will be um, built upon by uh, John Stuart Mill, the son of his very good friend. Uh, John Stuart Mill is going to write a work entitled On Liberty, and uh, he's going to be seen by some as being the father of liberalism, but uh, he comes out of this utilitarian background. Robert Owen will come to talk about here later as a socialist. Uh, he's an atheist who is looking to bring about changes in society. So there's some people who are rather fatalistic who say well this is the way things are and you don't do any good for anybody by trying to change anything. You fact create greater catastrophes so just let things molder the way that they are and then you have people on the other side who are saying well hey we think that uh, things could be better and we can figure out ways to make society better. In the area of politics coming here out of the Industrial Revolution, what we're going to find is that uh, there's going to be enthusiasm in England uh, that follows on the French Revolution, also in Europe, for greater liberalization, to embrace some of those freedoms that were espoused in the French Revolution, and to have greater participation in government. And so what's going to happen is that uh, workers in England are going to sign on to great charters for a long time. Eventually, by 1832, there will be some uh, parliamentary reform, but uh, there'll be great charters with lists of names where people are signing on to uh, request that Parliament would bring about changes, and particularly that there would be uh, greater participation in government uh, for people who are workers. Uh, while there's philosophical discussions about the changes in society, uh, there are also those that want to bring about uh, social reform. And in response, some of that will come out of uh, uh, the followers of, uh, like Bentham, but it'll also come within the church, where we'll see that there'll be evangelicals that will be pushing for change, and they're going to play a key role in uh, getting rid of uh, slavery. Particularly famous is the abolitionist William Wilberforce. He's part of something known as the Clapham sect. Uh, they saw their position as being one that had been God-given that they should use to bring about reform in society. And so they're going to be very influential in um, uh, shaping some of the moral tone, some of the laws that come out in England. All the reformers aren't evangelicals. Again, they tend to be coming from within the church. But uh, coming out of utilitarianism, you're going to have people like Edwin Chadwick, who is going to write his work on the condition of the working class in 1842. And he's going to push for reforms in regard to sanitation and housing and uh, other social issues in England at this point in time. As you think about the Industrial Revolution uh, following this lecture, I trust that once again you're going to be thinking about how has this changed the world in which I live and uh, the Western civilization and uh, what are the really significant things that were happening here uh, during this time. Thanks for your attention.